On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to take another look at the book of Enoch. It's been a fascinating study. Uh, we began some months ago studying the book of Enoch, and we'll soon be finished with it. But this particular portion, I think, is of uh, special interest. It's chapters 83 through 91. We come to the fourth book. Now, there are seven, you know, of these ancient scrolls that make up the book of Enoch. This fourth scroll is called the Dream Visions, in which Enoch tells his son Methuselah that back before I was married, when I was a young man, not yet 65 years old, I had two dreams. Gary Stimmon is here to discuss with me those two dreams of Enoch when he was young. And J.R., I like the way this opens. I have to read the, the first couple of verses uh, of chapter 83. And now it says, my son Methuselah, I will show thee all the visions I've seen, relating them before thee. Two visions I saw before I took a wife, and one of them was not similar to the other. The first time when I was learning to write, the second time before I took thy mother, I saw an awful vision, and on their account I petitioned to the Lord. Now, there's something just really personal and appealing about this. You sort of little, get a little glimpse into Enoch's family life as he's talking uh, to Methuselah here. Yeah. And uh, he mentions that he learned how to write. And, you know, contemporary uh, scholarship says that writing was not discovered really even until after Moses, very, very late in man's history. But there's a consistent strain that says that Enoch uh, wrote all these things down. And he was in the home of his grandfather when sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, and it's early in the morning before sunrise. He had this strange dream, and it was about the flood. Um, he goes on to say that he was muttering in his sleep, the earth is destroyed. He was very distraught over this. The earth is destroyed. And Mahalalel, his grandfather, shook him. Uh, and said, uh, Why dost thou cry, my son? And why dost thou lament so? And so he said, I told him about the vision. And here's the vision that he saw. Listen to it. He says, I was reposing in the house of Mahalaleel, my grandfather. There I saw the visions that the heavens were lowered and disappeared and fell on the earth. Now, Gary, this sounds like any normal Oklahoma storm, you know, <laughs> when the sky begins to fill with clouds and then it mm -hmm. begins lowering. And uh, here in, in Tornado Alley, when we see the sky lowering, that means a tornado's on its way. Yes, you know? indeed. So he saw the, the sky lowering and disappeared and fell on the earth. So, uh, in fact, he goes on to say that the earth was devoured in a great abyss and the mountains descended on mountains, and the hills sank upon hills, and high, heaves were torn, high trees were torn from the trunks and fell down and sank into the abyss. And then he cries, the earth is destroyed. This is exactly what one would think it would look like in the days of Noah's flood. Mm -hmm. So he has a dream of the future flood of Noah. As a matter of fact, the firmament began to collapse, according to Genesis, and the fountains of the great deep were opened, <clears throat> and the waters rose, and he really mentions all of this. Yes. And so after he wakes up, um, Mahalalia wakes him up, actually, he says that he arose and prayed and petitioned and wrote down my prayer for all the generations of the world and will show thee everything, my son. And as I went out below and looked at the heavens and the sun was rising in the east and the moon was descending in the west and some few stars and everything as he had known it from the first. And I blessed the Lord of the judgment. In other words, he went out. This verse says that his dream was in the waking hours of early morning. And you know, that's when most people have the most activity in their brains. Uh, most dreams are just before waking. And so it's true here. It's very typical of uh, one who would have a dream. And then he says he went out and he saw the sun was just fixing to come up. He saw the sun rising in the west. He saw the full moon setting. So now, though we don't know the month of the year, we do know that this was mid-month, the time of the full moon. And Mahalaleel does not seem surprised at this coming judgment. Uh, he had obviously looked at man 
as he existed before the flood and realized that man was due for judgment. Mm -hmm. Now we come to the second dream. And this one is mm, more, it's more lengthy than the first, okay? We come to chapter 85 and he sees the history of the human race beginning with Adam. The interesting thing is, Gary, the human race is depicted as animals. For example, he says, before I took thy mother Edna, and oh, by the way, he mentions his wife's name. I mm -hmm. think that's kind of interesting because we don't have that in the, in the Bible. There is one other place where mm -hmm. we're told that Enoch married a girl named Edna, and that's in the book of the Jubilees. So somehow one author read the other and both ended up with the word Edna. It says, behold, a bullock, that is Adam, came out of the earth, and the bullock was white, and after him came a female, that's Eve, of the same species, and together with this one came other cattle, and one of them was black, that would be Cain, and one red, that would be Abel, because his blood is spilled. So he's using metaphoric language here to describe the history of the human race. It's a fascinating read. I don't know that we will go through all of this on today's program, because you can get our magazine, the November issue of Prophecy in the News, and read it for yourself. But it is a good read. By the way, I should say that along with the text of the Book of Enoch, if you get the magazine, uh, you will find a commentary that will explain what the text means, saving you a lot of time and trouble uh, doing your own personal research. Yeah. So I went through all that. You did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, what we've got here is, at this point, is Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. So he says that w the black one horned the red one. Cain killed Abel and followed it over the earth. And then I could no longer see that red one. So now Abel is dead. And it goes on to say the black one grew and a cow, Cain's sister, wife, came with it. And I saw many cattle like it and following it came from it. So Cain had a posterity here. And that cow, Eve, the first one, came from the presence of the first bullock seeking the red one. Eve was wondering, where is Abel? And she went trying to find him, could not find it, and then raised a great cry. She was sorrowful. She knew something bad had happened. Verse 7, And I looked around, and that first bullock came to her. Adam came to her and quieted her, and from that time she did not cry aloud. And after that, she brought forth another white bullock. That would be Seth. And uh, after that, she brought forth many bullocks and black cows, many sons and daughters. So the story continues. And it's fascinating, Gary, that the author here <coughs> makes the human race to be in the form of metaphors. Mm. This is not unlike the dreams of the Old Testament. You remember Pharaoh dreamed about bullocks? Mm -hmm. Now, this dream uh, is setting out human history in a kind of allegorical form uh, with animals acting the parts of man and the animals are symbols of, of the types of people being represented. Mm -hmm. And as we get into this section, uh, uh, this, uh, interpreting these dreams, and J.R. has gone through all of this, in his article, uh, we have to ask several questions. When was this authored? Was Enoch the author? Was this altered in some way at a later time? Because there are some problems. For example, God, uh, the Father God, is seen as judge in, in uh, these narratives where we know that Messiah acts as judge uh, from our knowledge of the Bible. So we have to begin to kind of wonder, uh, mm -hmm. were there some textual alterations? Uh, or uh, is there another way to look at things? Well, we don't know that Enoch wrote this. Yeah. It's possible that he wrote it. I'm not here to tell you that he didn't. It's possible also that maybe those last chapters you're talking about were altered by someone in the Maccabean era mm -hmm. that changed up the text. We can't tell you that's what happened. Uh, but there are some interesting discrepancies as we get along a little further. I want you to notice that the Bible uses metaphors. Just like I said, 
Pharaoh's dream of seven mm -hmm. um, fat cows and seven lean cows that ate the fat cows. And then there was Daniel, you know, who dreamed that certain nations had animal motifs. And so it is not uncommon for metaphors of this kind to be used. He goes, he, he talks about a star falling from heaven. Now this one is really interesting because uh, as I think of fallen angels, and I think of what God said to Job, Job chapter 38, you know, he called angels the morning stars, they mm -hmm. sang together. And here we see a falling star. Yes, very similar to what John used in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm when the star fell from heaven, and his name was Apollyon. Oh, yes. Okay. Now this one, of course, was Azazel. You remember him. He's the first one of the fallen angels who came down to the earth. And, it, and it, he describes him here as he and the other angels began to beget giants of human women. It's a fascinating read. And then as we go on into uh, chapter 87, chapter 88, we have the history of the human race. We come down to Moses. We have Noah, for example, uh, who builds a boat, and Moses who uh, builds a tabernacle. And it comes all the way down to we have the Philistines and the Amalekites and the Edomites and King Saul, okay? Mm -hmm. And when he gets to these people, he uses other metaphors. When he got to, for example, he gets to Jacob. When Jacob is born of Isaac, and every... All of the ancient, um, the, the, uh, the main characters uh, from Adam and Seth and Abraham and Isaac and so on, they're white bullocks, okay? Mm -hmm. When he gets to Jacob, Jacob is a sheep mm -hmm. and then becomes the lineage of the chosen people. They are all sheep. So white bullocks up until that point, Jacob then becomes a white sheep. And the interesting thing about the sheep is that the sheep is the animal of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And to me that says why Israel has been sacrificed down through history. You know, they have been a people who have, who have been persecuted and killed and slaughtered by nations of all kinds. And the Gentile nations are depicted as wild animals. Mm -hmm though the sheep is the domesticated animal. So when we come to the Philistines, he calls them dogs. The Amalekites, foxes. And the Edomites, wild boars. And um, then, of course, King Saul was a, a buck. That is a male sheep. He talks about Elijah. He talks about uh, Michael. And by the way, we, we, as we get close to the end of this dream, um, the author says that God appoints 70 shepherds over the sheep. 70 shepherds over the sheep. Now, these shepherds are angels. <clears throat> and we have, in, in my thinking, no other place in all of literature, even apocalyptic literature, or even in rabbinical writings, we don't have 70 shepherds, mm -hmm. angels watching over. Now, we have guardian angels. We have watchers that watch the human race. But in this particular dream, it, it, uh, it's God saying, I'm appointing these 70 angels, not all together at one time, but one after the other after the other, to watch over the chosen people. And when I say kill, you kill. But then God comes to Michael and says, Michael, you keep an eye on these 70 shepherds, and you write down when they go too far. And in the end, God judged those 70 shepherds and said, you all went too far and you, you killed more than I wanted you to, so I'm throwing you all into hell. I don't know that that would be what Enoch would write. Mm. I, I think maybe that was some interpolator in later years. If Enoch wrote this, I think the 70 angels were added by some rabbi in the Maccabean era. Well, to sum up, what we have here in chapter 88 is the angel Raphael who incarcerates the angel Azazel down in this underground vault, if you will, this abyss. And then we have the story of Noah. <clears throat> we have the story of the patriarchs. 
As JR has just said, we come right down through Moses. We come down to the days of the Philistines. All of these are represented in, in the forms of animals. And I must say, uh, regardless of the author, it's fascinating to see how animals are used as symbols of human behavior, most particularly sheep, because our Lord is the great shepherd and uh, his people are yes. sheep. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It is. So the idea of the sheep is a good motif or a good metaphor. Yeah. Uh, we come down, for example, to the lineage of David, and then we come down to the Babylonian captivity. We have the um, Babylonians being depicted as one kind of wild animal, and uh, the for Persians is another kind of wild animal. But the whole thing comes down to the days of the Maccabees, when the, uh, the, the Assyrians uh, come in against Israel. Mm -hmm. Antiochus for Epiphanes commits the abomination of desolation. And at this point, Gary, with, with the captivity um, of Israel and the fighting in the days of Antiochus for Epiphanes, mm -hmm. uh, we have the conclusion of the dream. It's, it's as if the one who concludes this dream, whether it begins with Enoch and ends with somebody else or not, I don't know. But we have the Messianic kingdom being set up immediately after the days of the Maccabees. Yeah, we have uh, actually uh, the conquering Alexander sort of referred to here. The day, and after that, of course, uh, or during that period when the, the Middle East was power structure was rebuilt and the Seleucids came to power and battled with the Maccabees. You've got essentially all that represented here, but then you sort of get to the end of days right there at that point, which yeah. to us is a mistaken way of looking at things. Right, and we don't know exactly why this happened. But, uh, for example, he calls the Greeks eagles, he calls the Egyptians vultures, he calls the Syrians crows, he calls the people of Thrace, uh, that would be the Macedonian area where... Um, Alexander the Great originally came from, calls them buzzards. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, you know, Judas Maccabeus, he conquers the Syrians, uh, he uh, leads the people to victory, and then, for some strange reason, the Lord of the sheep, that would be Jehovah, puts a stop to everything. And uh, so he sets up the judgment, the final judgment of the nations. And uh, he establishes the kingdom, and the Messiah is born. That's, that's kind of interesting. The Messiah is born, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, then finally, when the kingdom is set up, listen to what happens. Uh, this would be uh, chapter 90, beginning in verse 35, and the eyes of all them were opened, and they saw the good, and there was not one among them that did not see. And I saw that the house was large and broad and exceedingly full, and I saw that white bullock, the Messiah, was born, and his horns were large, and all the wild beasts and all the birds of heaven feared him and petitioned him at all times. In other words, he sets up the Messianic kingdom. Mm -hmm. Verse 38, and I saw till all their generation were changed, and they all became white bullocks. In other words, the wild animals who were converted, the sheep who were the chosen people, they all became, as Adam was originally, a white bullock. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then he says, the first of them, that it was the Word. That's, Jesus, that's Messiah first. is referred to as the Word. Yeah. Now, that really brings up a point. Because the authorship of this was in the Maccabean days, or, or whether or not it was, whether it was written by Enoch or, the, or some scribe in the days of the Maccabees, the idea of the Word was present at that time as a messianic hope. And that's really fascinating to me. It is, isn't it? Yeah. It's a great read. But the interesting thing about this is that the book of Daniel also seems to close with the uh, Maccabean era. Uh, yeah. He's, you know, today we look at the book of Daniel and we say, well, he stops with that, with Antiochus for Epiphanes. In the next verse, he slips over to the Antichrist. And so there's a gap there, which we call, by the way, the dispensation of grace. Yes. Right? 
from the 69th week to the 70th week, there's an indeterminate period of time. But if you were reading back in the days of Daniel or thereafter in the days of Haggai or Mac, uh, Malachi or you were <coughs> there in the days of the Maccabees, it, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know that the Maccabean era, Antiochus for Epiphanes and the Syrians, would not be the end of it. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know that the Messiah is going to come and be rejected and be killed and rise again three days later and go back home to heaven. You wouldn't know that. And so maybe, I don't know, maybe God was just blinding Enoch's eyes at this point. Maybe he was blinding uh, Daniel's eyes at that point. But we do have a strange thing. We have everything yeah. seemingly ending with the days of the Maccabees. With the days of the Maccabees. And then <clears throat> we saw, we see this in verse 31 uh, uh, here uh, of the section we've been describing. And after that, those three who were dressed in white, Michael's archangel companions who had led me, Enoch, up before, took me by the hand and the hand of that buck, Elijah, taking hold of me, they raised me, put me down in the midst of those sheep before the judgment took place. Yeah. And here we have what becomes a fascinating historical note that I think has uh, resonations that come down to us even today. Absolutely. Uh, Elijah is pictured as a buck who ascends to heaven mm -hmm. to the place where Enoch is and the two of them live in heaven in this special wonderful place mm -hmm. and then in the days of the judgment that mm -hmm. would be the tribulation period the Lord has Michael's friends three archangels bring Enoch and Elijah back down to the earth mm -hmm. before the judgment took place. Right. I uh, Gary, this led Tertullian, who, by the way, Tertullian was born in the year A.D. 140. He died around the year 220. So that we're talking second, third century here. Tertullian believed that the two witnesses would be Enoch and Elijah because of this statement. Now, we don't know who wrote this. We don't know if it was Enoch who wrote this or if it was some rabbi in the days of the Maccabees wrote this. Mm -hmm. Because of the 70 shepherds, you know, it lends, it lends toward doubting the authenticity of this particular part of the book of Enoch. Which, by the way, Enoch was not, shall we say, verbally inspired and, and uh, preserved by God like the Bible was. That's one reason why Enoch didn't end up in the Bible. But Tertullian believed that the book of Enoch was and you've got to understand now, Tertullian was born in North Africa. He was a, uh, an African who converted to Christianity. And he was one of the great preachers of his generation. <coughs> mm -hmm. All right. Tertullian believed that the book of Enoch was inspired and should have been included in the canon of Scripture. And J.R., here's something else. He believed the book of Revelation. Obviously, he knew about the book of Revelation because he was aware of the two witnesses. And it was centermost in his thinking because he, he wrote that Enoch and Elijah would be the two witnesses. And he reasoned that because they're the only two men in history who had, had not seen death, but yeah. they had been translated. Yeah. Well, we may have something to add to that. Yeah, he got that <laughs> right out of the book of Enoch. Yes. And this is what he says, quote, and this, by the way, is in his book called A Treatise on the Soul, chapter 50, written by Tertullian. He says, quote, Enoch, no doubt, was translated, and so was Elijah. Nor did they experience death. It was postponed, and only postponed. Most certainly, they are reserved for the suffering of death, that by their blood they may extinguish Antichrist. Now, Gary, there's something wrong with that thinking, because when the rapture takes place, all the saints who are alive at that moment will escape death. Mm -hmm. You see, Enoch and Elijah are a type of the future rapture of the church. You remember the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, The Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So you see, Enoch and Elijah are not the only ones that escape death. This thinking that they must come back and die says, what happens to the rest of us, you mm. know? Yes. <laughs> so here we, we get a, a rare glimpse into the way ideas are formed over yes. time. And the debate goes on to this very day. I recently read, or wrote, that is, an article for Prophecy in the News about the identity of the two witnesses. And I received much mail from people who disagreed with me about the identity of those witnesses. The debate goes on, and it will, I'm convinced, until the rapture of the church. <laughs> but that's okay, because godly men can disagree. Yes, the big idea is that the two witnesses have to be Enoch and Elijah. Wait a minute. Enoch was not a Jew, okay? Oh, his posterity, yes, became the Jews. Right. But, hey, I'm from his posterity, too. <laughs> All right? So he was a Gentile. <clears throat> the two witnesses in the book of Revelation deal with the rebuilding of the temple. Do you remember? John takes a measuring. He measures the temple, the court, then would dwell therein. But the court which is without, that is the court of the Gentiles, leave out for it's given to the Gentiles for 42 months. And then he talks about the two witnesses. So they are the, the leadership of the Jews who rebuild the temple. And these two witnesses have power, one, to shut up heaven that it rain not. Elijah did that. Or to turn water to blood. Moses did that. And we have on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah who meets with the Lord. Mm. Uh, Gary, those who say it's Enoch, take it right from this, this unauthenticated portion mm. of the book of Enoch. A and it would seem uh, erroneously, because we, we build a pretty good case for Moses and Elijah. But the discussion will continue, I'm sure. Yes. We won't be around to see them anyway because we're <laughs> expecting the rapture to take us out before the tribulation period. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you need to trust Him today. He died for you to give you eternal life. Ask Him to forgive you and save you, will you? I'm J.R. Church with Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up.